What makes the achievement of emotional sobriety so difficult is the habits we have, the patterns we have in our behavior, the habitual ways that we've come to think about things. We have to really become aware of those things in order to challenge them because the consciousness that has created a lot of the problems in our life cannot solve it, cannot change things. So what happens is, is the first step is waking up. Now, we've been walking through the 12 steps. Um, it was interesting. We were talking before the meeting started tonight. I was talking to AJ, and she found this great paragraph that really related to some of the stuff we've been talking about in step eight. But so many things in the, in the 12 and 12 have hidden in plain sight. And I was reading it about maybe 20 years ago now. And I came across this line in, in when Bill was talking about step 12. He says, you know, and I'm, and I'm paraphrasing this, but if we practice these principles in our daily affairs that we and, and those around us begin to achieve emotional sobriety. So here in the 12 and 12, he expressly states that this is the desired outcome, the intended outcome if we work these steps to achieve emotional sobriety. Now, of course, Emotional sobriety is first dependent on our physical sobriety. But once we achieve that, now we're working on growing up. We're working on growing ourselves in the direction that we were meant to grow. See, I believe that it's a God-given trait to move us towards our wholeness. Um, I spoke at the uh, National Jewish Retreat last week. It's the first time I've inv been invited to do so. And it was because I made a comment uh, a review of, of Rabbi Shace Tobb's book, God of Our Understanding, highly recommend it. It's an outstanding book, God of Our Understanding. Um, I think it's in hardcover now on, and cheaper than softcover, Brian pointed out to me last week when I was telling him about it. But uh, um, I was there and, you know, he was talking about, you know, in the beginning, the how who would have known that with Roland Hazard, who went over to Zurich, Switzerland to treat with Dr. Carl Jung, how that would have planted a seed that would eventually grow into Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 steps as we know it today. And Jung was um, in the 60s after this is all unfolded and stuff. I guess they were sitting around general service office said that you know, it probably would be a good idea if we let Dr. Jung know what his role was in the formation of this, of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so they wrote him a letter and there's now some correspondence started happening between Jung and, and Bill Wilson. And in one of the things he says, well, I couldn't, you know, when I talked to Roland Hazard, I didn't share with him everything that I thought. And I'm going to paraphrase this too. He says, but what I really believe is, is that his craving for alcohol was a low-level spiritual thirst that our being has for wholeness. And see, Young even saw it at that point in time, is that we, we are really designed to move towards being what we can be. Psychologists have labeled that self-actualization. Other people call it holiness. Whatever label you put on it, it doesn't matter because we're moving always towards being what we can be. And that's what emotional sobriety is about, is for you to become what you can be, which is a fully functioning human being where we're standing on our own two feet and we're not overly dependent on our, on our environment to be okay. That's the arc of our development. That's what's trying to be restored I believe, in the work that we're doing in the steps. And so we've been kind of marching through these steps and looking at the therapeutic benefit, the impact that the step has and how, and, you know, this, this kind of energy builds up in one step and then is 
uh, discharged in the next step, and then another energy builds up, and we keep moving towards this becoming what we can be. And now we're, we've pivoted in step six and seven towards having the best possible attitude towards life. And as always happens, once we achieve something, now the next step comes along and says, okay, in order to do that, make a list of all the people you've harmed and become willing to make amends to them. And so we spend many, many weeks looking at the harm we've done to ourselves. And that's the paragraph that AJ read um, or posted in a Facebook post on it, which is just great. AJ, maybe you could put it in the chat as I'm talking about it so people could see it. That would be wonderful. So we've looked at the harm that, that we've done to ourselves, and I talked about it as, as this self-hating process. And once again, one of the things I'm doing here is I'm looking at what I would call the unusual suspects in step eight. The usual suspects is we've harmed ourselves, right, by drinking or using or whatever ways we've acted out, all of those things. But here now, we're really looking at the unusual suspects in our life. So after we concluded looking at the harm we've done to ourselves, the last couple of weeks, we've started looking at what harm we've done to others. And last week, I introduced a bunch of unusual suspects, not the, the usual suspects of I've lied to someone or I've cheated with them or betrayed them or, you know, stolen from them. But the unusual suspects are things that we don't think of. And I want to continue with that list tonight. All right. So please, if you haven't, if you weren't here last week, um, you can go back, thanks to Patrick and his work, and watch the video from last week. And Patrick will post or Tom will post um, in the chat how you can do that. So here's the list of the, the additional, more unusual suspects, as I've called it. So the first one I've written down is, I am sorry that I have not taken more responsibility for my growth. And this is making amends to someone that you're in an intimate and close relationship or even with your children. I have not taken more responsibility for my growth and that I have not taken more responsibility to fill my gaps of knowledge in how to show up in the best way I can in our relationship, in my life, in our life. Unusual suspect number one for tonight. Number two, I am sorry that I have avoided my pain. That if I, I've avoided dealing with some of the trauma that I've had in my life. And I am sorry for my lack of faith in my ability to cope with life as it is. My lack of faith has cost us terribly in terms of suffering. I am sorry for resisting, not wanting to wake up and see that I've been asleep, see the things that I haven't wanted to see. I'm sorry that I've had such selective inattention and that I only looked at things that, I, that made me feel comfortable and that I avoided looking at any of the things in my life that made me uncomfortable. I am sorry that I didn't take more responsibility to raise my level of consciousness in our life. I am sorry for projecting my perfectionism onto you and onto our relationship. You could never live up to my standards and I never failed to let you know that. But that was a projection because I could never live up to my standards either. But that's one of the things I did to harm myself. But my projection of my perfectionism harmed you too. It made our relationship, it was a curse to our relationship. I am sorry for dismissing your emotions. Because I didn't know how to deal with what was going on with you. Sometimes I would dismiss it and, and, and think that that somehow 
now erased my need to respond to you, but it didn't. It just left you very alone in our relationship. I'm sorry for disapproving of you and shaming you for when you didn't do things the way I thought you should do them. I am sorry for not learning how to stay connected to you when we were having trouble. I'm sorry for not learning how to not alienate you when things were going south and that the way I interacted with you and the way I talked to you about the troubles we were having really polarized us. And I became your adversary, not your partner. And finally, I am sorry for not learning how to speak to you more personally. There are many times that I could not find the words that would really accurately reflect what I was experiencing in our relationship. And so what I did is I just avoided you a lot of times. I'm sorry for not learning how to deliver the whole message. So many times when I communicated to you in our relationship, I only shared with you a portion of what was really going on with me. I didn't know how to deliver the whole message to you. So when you, can, when you hear me saying these things, you can see that there's so many nuances or what I've called the unusual suspects that if we really stop and take a look at what's happened for us and what our development, how our development has been arrested and what that, that you know, arrested development, how that has impacted our life is that the impact is significant. It makes me sad when I say all those things. All those things are true for me. And I think true for many of you that are listening to me. And yet we don't face them. We don't look at them. We don't talk about them. We don't think about including them in terms of making amends. We reach for what I would call the low-hanging fruit most of the time. Those things that are quite obvious to us. But I think if we're going to really, really do the work that's going to help us achieve emotional sobriety, we cannot be content with low-hanging fruit. We need to strive to go beyond that. We need to take that journey down, as Father Richard Rohr says, the journey that most people don't want to take. We need to deconstruct a lot of our ideas and attitudes. In fact, this is what Dr. Carl Jung, this is how he described and defined a spiritual experience is that it really reorganizes one's personality completely. And there's a whole shift in terms of one's concepts and ideas of how one is supposed to be, how life is supposed to be, essentially giving up the old ideas, the ones that didn't work, for a set of better ideas that help us learn how to show up in our life in the best possible way. Well, that's what we're doing here in step eight, is we're looking at these things that we've done to harm ourselves and to others, and looking at them not from a position of judgment, but from compassion. From a position of, wow, now I'm seeing who I am not so I can become what I can be. We're not doing this and we're not going to beat ourselves up because that's one of those old ideas that if I beat myself up enough, I've done something about the problem. Well, that's never the case. If you want to do something about the problem, understand yourself more. Understand the pattern that you see in your behavior. That's what this step eight is about, is looking at the pattern to our behavior. 
and there's so much value in it. It's just incredible. It's like worth 10 years of psychoanalysis if you do this properly, I believe. It's a phenomenal experience. So with that, I will now invite my esteemed colleagues, Roger and Tom, to join me. Gosh, Alan, um, again, this week, I, I think this is such a cool slant, man, that you've come up with about, uh, um, you know, these unusual suspects. Because um, um, I think one way or another, through knowing you all these years and, and us talking uh, through my own interests, through reading your, your, your work, um, I've thought about every one of these issues, but I've never tied them in in this way in terms of, uh, you know, step eight and in terms of harm that we were doing ourselves and in that process, harm that we're doing to those we care about as well. And when you're, when you're going through these things, I just see so much of myself, right. And, and, my my history um i i think it it does bring me back to that theme of of you know begin with efforts to know myself right begin with efforts to identify my own patterns my own anxieties my own ways i cover my own ways i hide um because i can see clearly that in my friendships and especially in my really primary relationships um, I have, you know, especially if I haven't been feeling good about myself, especially if I've been feeling insecure, that's when I'm most likely to project my perfectionism on my partner. That's when I'm most likely to, in a subtle way, hopefully, where they can't confront me about it, I'll, <laughs> I'll shame them or I'll criticize them or I'll, I'll diminish them in some way. And to me, we, we are masters, or at least I, I got pretty good at it and still can be at certain moments of, you know, doing these things in a way where we can kind of avoid detection or at least avoid direct confrontation, right? But still get that little zinger in there that we want to get or still get that little boost of, um, you know, expressing resentment for me or expressing um, anxiety, like I said. So... I, I look at this list and the other reaction I have is, wow, this is overwhelming, man. This is a lot. You add these to the ones you, you brought up last week and you can go like, oh, my God, there's so many things I need to work on. There's so many improvements I need to make in myself. Where the hell do I possibly begin? You know, and I my answer to that for me is, well, begin with the ones that speak to me the most. And start to pay attention to like one of those at a time for a week. Maybe try to pay attention to how that comes up for me in my life and then move to another one. But at some point, get to the ones who don't speak to me because I really have a lot to learn <laughs> by paying attention to those. Right. The ones that I go like, oh, I've got that handled. Oh, I've got that covered. I got past that one already. That's not my experience in my life. My experience is like the we use the, the examples of layers of an onion a lot in therapy. You know, we'll peel back one layer and we think we got it handled. And then the next day, somebody will say something that hurts my feelings or I'll get pissed off at somebody about something. And I haven't resolved that issue completely at all. I've just moved to a deeper level in my relationship to that issue. But I have grown with the layer of that onion that I just helped peel away. And I feel good in that growing. See, that's the thing. Like you say, like you and Tom Bo say, it's not about pursuit of perfection with any of this. But it's just about feeling more and more aligned with my spirit, more and more aligned with my truth. Um, and understanding that this is a, li it's just, it's a lifelong process, emotional sobriety. It's a lifelong process. It is certainly for me. I don't have any ideas of ever uh, of ever getting this stuff down very well, because 
life keeps showing me I haven't, <laughs> especially when I think I have. <laughs> okay, especially when I think I have. So um, thank you. Thank you again, Al. Um, each one of these is really good food for reflection and good food for, for looking at, you know, how these, these show up in myself and in my life. So go ahead. Amen. Tom. Amen, buddy. It's, it's like, <clears throat> yeah, I'd love, I love how you describe how we are become masters at the, what I call the cheap shots, you know, being able to, being able to cheap shot somebody and then keep moving, you know? And if they say, what, what did you, why'd you do that? You go, what, what, what me? No, uh, I'm sorry. I was muted. It's, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's i i want to speak i want to speak to to the to the to the overwhelming nature of this this list that alan has uh has has been churning up for everybody because you you talked about it being overwhelming uh, roger i saw somebody uh briefly in the chat i saw somebody somebody's response was this is rough <laughs> i thought I, and i identified <laughs> with that a lot that, that, no, no shit man it's like um uh, and one of the things, though, that I that I that, that I realize that can help with that I believe can help with us when we get overwhelmed, especially with content. When and there is a lot of just this is rich with content, Alan. It's like what you're doing. I mean, these are lists that this is the kind of list, by the way, that you don't complete the list either. It's like this is uh, you know there are a lot of lists in therapy where I ask people to start a list and keep it in a place in their journal or on their computer or someplace where they can return to it and keep adding to it. And you can add to this list forever it's like uh, because because what i want to do is shift to say one of the things i that i do when i'm really overwhelmed with content is i shift to process and understand so as i was thinking so i try to back out about halfway through what you were saying alan and start thinking process and what i re what i what i began to think about was what you're just what you're talking about is is from the big picture is responsibility at a, at a, at a very a radical responsibility at a very, at a very deep level. Um, and responsibility. Now I'm going to refer to the content too, though. Responsibility though, for things that we very often have not thought that we need that, that were necessary, that we have to pay attention to specifically that they would have any impact on someone else. It's, it's like, that's one of the things I think that, that I'm, I'm getting out of this is what you, your, your part of, of, the, the this series on on step eight uh is is basically it's like a preparation to approach step nine from the most mature place i could ever have imagined doing it from being you know like i, I you know i actually think by the time i get to step nine on this round I may be a, I may be a fucking adult, you know, it's, it's like, I, you know, it's, it's, it's like, there's so there it is, it is, it is, you know, I just feel like I'm going to show, I'm going to show up for step nine with, with just really my feet on the ground, grounded, ready, ready to go. And, and I'm, and not, and not a, not, not an imposter. I'm, I'm there. I'm really, I'm doing the work on myself. So I'll say that, but the responsibility, one of, I, you know, it, there's a lot of different angles I could, I could take, but I think about a couple of my, my little uh, nutshells. One, one of them is the first part of any problem that I have to solve is that which is between me and me. You know, the first part of any problem I have to solve. It doesn't mean other people don't have some part of it. That's one of the things I love about AA. It doesn't say other people are never to blame for anything. What it says is start with you. Start, and, and it's like, this is really just so deep about starting the responsibility uh, w with me. Uh, and the other, the other little nutshell that it reminds me of is the one I, that I have uh, that says, um, uh, uh, if you don't see yourself as part of a problem, you're not going to be part of the solution. You know, it's always when we're trying to, we have to get that dis differentiation, Alan, that you talk about so that we have a relationship to the problem so that we can, we can, that you and I work on all the time and talk to people about, but still it's, we still have to own it. We still have to own our, our part in any of that. And uh, that's, and that's what I hear you talking about is so rather than be overwhelmed with the list of the content list, what I'm thinking is in terms of un there's a way to, com to, to comprehend what you're saying as I am making a stronger commitment than I have made in the past. And I've made commitments in the past about this, but I'm going to make, I'm going to deepen my commitment to approaching 
any of this stuff, any, any of this inventory, as I look at things I may have that I have done to harm other people, I'm going to start by looking at myself and I'm going to see the things I'm, what I'm looking for are things that not things I could have done differently, but things I was, I, I, that I am responsible for. Play, the sins of omission, things I did not do. And what you're with the twist you're putting on it is things I did not do for myself that ultimately are, have rip, the ripple. We talk about the ripple effect all the time, but ultimately the, the, the ripple effect of harm gets out to other people. And, and I, and, and so that, that I can hold on to. And even when I forget all the content, I can remember that idea of my job is to come at this from the inside out and with the concept of responsibility, looking for the things that I have not done that I should, that I need to be, that I want to be responsible for. Uh, and that's, and that's a big one for me too, that it's not, because one of the things I think it's very important to be responsible for is our recovery in the biggest picture. I have, uh, I speak to people frequently about the idea that to say, it's not okay to choose to enter into something, which is like recovery to enter, and, and then act like somebody's trying to make you do it. And that's what a lot of us do. We act like somebody's forcing us to it. We start fighting back. And it's like, what we need to remember is that we're choosing this. And so what, what I want to be able to do with this is say, I am choosing to, to, to become more and more acquainted with my responsibilities, the ones and, and the ones that I have accomplished, the ones that I deserve credit for, because I think that's one of the things that we have done uh, to harm ourselves, by the way. Uh, and the, the harmful to other people is is in the, in the spirit of this some sort of strange, uh, p- poor definition of humility. We refuse to take credit for the progress we've made, and so we we hold on to this false humility, which I, which I found very damaging in my life. But the idea is we, I want to be able to, to take credit where credit is due, and I want to be able to always look at the things I still have to work on. And like you said, Roger, have no, no intention whatsoever of finishing that until, uh, until I stop breathing. And then maybe after, I don't know what happens after that. So that's what I got to say. Wow. So many great comments from both of you in terms of this thing. I just love the, some of the comments in the chat. I want to read a few of them. Like, this is rough. I love that's right on. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I felt it when I was reading it. Susie from Chicago goes, mea culpa. And <laughs> so how in the world does a relationship work if both parties are so damaged? Well, you know, it's such a great question, Susie. I, I, I want to probably devote, you know, a whole evening to us discussing that. But see, I think we're getting away from this myth that we have to be more than we are to be okay. See, if people could really enter into the relationship with this level of humility and authenticity, Mm -hmm. my God, so much more would be possible between them. You know, I'm reminded of this line from, uh, uh, I think it was a Noel Coward's play. He said, Coward, take this coward's hand and together we shall go forward. And that's what this is about, right? Is meeting each other in this way and dropping all of this bullshit. Like, oh my God, look at how great I'm going to be. You know, Susie, I'm going to be the knight in, in, in shining armor that you've always waited for, for right? And you get together with me and you're really, fuck, that ar- rust, armor is quite rusted. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that shiny. Got it. The closer I get to you, the, the more it changes. I mean, so then reality. That, that's, that's aluminum foil. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. My God. Or it's not, you know, whatever. But see, that that is what happens is that we create these kinds of ideas about who we have to be to be loved, et cetera, et cetera. And it's crazy, but I will work on this list and uh, hopefully I'll have them available next week or the week after for in a PDF file for Tom to post in the chat. So Tom, Alan, I want to, I want to just say something real quick before I know we're running late, but you, cause you said something just now that is, that, that is a 
direct connection to something I was just talking to someone about earlier today in, in therapy. And they were talking about sort of what, what Susie was saying about how can we possibly do, how can we possibly do this as messed up as we are? And, you know, how am I ever going to get good enough to be well enough to be in a relationship? How will I ever find somebody well enough to do that? And, and I just, I, you know, and, and, you know, and I just used my own relationship with my wife as the example, I, you know, which I've done frequently to say, Dee Dee and I are both alcoholics. We're both we both have depression. We both you know we have we both have a lot of stuff, uh, uh, and uh, we were both still drinking. You know when we got together, it's like you know and part of what you know when I was I was using that sort of what you're saying is like you know what we did is is we ultimately we fort- we're fortunate in that way, but it, it's 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 like the idea that we actually went through this together. Yeah. You know, and 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 uh, we grew up together in that in that way. And so I think it is important to realize that, yeah, there, there isn't this thing where there is this particular place we have to be in order to be in a relationship. It's like, you know, it's it's, you know, human humans have been radically imperfect from the beginning. So, you know, right. somehow we're pulling it off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, just one other thing, you know, Laura said from last week, well, how do I know if I need to make amends? Well, I hope that's been answered. <laughs> I mean, it's clear we all have amends to make because all of us are, you know, we're a work in progress. I remember the bumper sticker I saw that I loved. I thought everybody should be issued this bumper sticker. Please be patient with me. God isn't finished with me yet. I hear a lot of people criticize the 12 steps that they're old fashioned. I can understand that criticism. They were written back in 1935. Some people that are agnostic have difficulty with the word God used in the steps. For me, I look at the process that's involved, the forces that the 12 steps generate are so powerful that I think they're ageless. There's this interesting phenomena that happens when you work the steps. They create a a charge and then a discharge. You know, the first step, we're powerless. Our life has become unmanageable. It creates this charge. You know, we're in big trouble and we don't know what to do. And then step two comes along and it says we have hope. That charge, that existential crisis that we have is resolved. What's happening here? is parallel to life. We charge ourselves when we breathe in. When we exhale, we discharge. That's the rhythm of life. And the way I love to think about the 12 steps, it's helping us get connected to the rhythm of life so we can learn how to show up in a good way.